I'm going to do uh, a little bit, just two quotes about the importance of the need for an ordained priest to watch over the victim's soul. It's Jesus' command. And uh, I'm only going to do two quotes because there's many more I could give you, but because we need to move on to my final uh, talk, which is what it means to live in the fourth degree of the divine will. But what I'm going to read is important since uh, a victim's soul, Jesus says... This is from volume 19, June the 15th, 1926. Indeed, my daughter, if no one had known that I had come upon earth, redemption would have been something dead and without effects for creatures. So knowledge gave life to its fruits. The same will be for my will. Knowledge will give life to the fruits of my will. This is why I wanted to renew what I did in redemption, choosing another virgin, remaining hidden within her for 40 years and more, segregating her from everyone as if in a new Nazareth, to be free with her, to tell the whole story, the prodigies and the goods contained in it, so as to be able to form the life of my will in you. And just as I chose St. Joseph to be together with me and my mama as our cooperator, our tutor, and vigilant sentry for me and for the Sovereign Queen, in the same way I have placed near you the vigilant assistance of my ministers as cooperators, tutors and depositories of the knowledges, the goods and the prodigies contained in my will. And since my will wants to establish its kingdom in the midst of peoples, through you I want to deposit this celestial doctrine in my ministers as my new apostles, so that first I may form with them the link of connection with my will, and then they may transmit it into the midst of peoples. If it were not so, or were not to be so, I would not have insisted so much on having you right, nor would I have permitted the daily coming of the priest. But I would have left all my work between me and you. Therefore be attentive and leave me free to do whatever I want in you. Now from volume 4, December the 4th, 1902. When I choose a soul as victim for the grave needs of present in the church, a priest must offer her to me. Now do you see what the priest is offering? He is offering a living host of Jesus' divine humanity to the Father. So this is a, a living Eucharistic act. He must offer her to me, assist her for me, help her and encourage her to suffer. <clears throat> my daughter, I wanted them to find the reason of my operating by themselves 
because in my life from the moment I was born up to my death everything can be found since the life of the whole church is enclosed in it. When compared to some step that can be conformed to my life, the most difficult matters are solved. The most tangled situations are unravelled and in the most obscure and abstruse ones, such that the human mind almost becomes lost in that obscurity, one finds the clearest and the brightest light. This means that they do not have my life as the rule of their operation. He, he's talking here about um, the priests who are, have been placed over Louisa. And I'm oh, sorry, I didn't read the first paragraph when she says, I was thinking in my mind about this obedience, you know, to the priest saying, they are right in commanding me this way. Besides, it is not such a great thing that the Lord would allow me to obey in the way wanted by them. So they say either he should let you obey or he should tell the reason why he wants the confessor to come to make you come around from that state. This is her state of petrification that she had every night. And it required the blessing of a priest to bring her back to love. And so she's pondering this, you see, because some priests refused to bless her and bring her back. The longest time she was left petrified was, I think, 18 days, which was one of her hardest sufferings. While I was thinking of this, my adorable Jesus moved in my interior and said what I just read to you. And he, he's making a qualification about the priest. He says, this means that they do not have my life in them as the rule of their operating, otherwise they would found, have found the reason. But since they have not found the reason themselves, it is necessary that I speak and manifest it. After this he stood up and with empire, but so much that I became fearful. He said, what is the meaning of that show yourself to the priest? That's in the Gospel of Redemption. Then becoming sweeter, he added, my power extended everywhere and from any place I was, I could operate the most sensational miracles. Yet in almost all my miracles, I wanted to be personally present. As for example, when I resurrected Lazarus, I went there, I had them remove the sepulchral stone, then I had him released. And then with the empire of my voice, I called him back to life. In resurrecting the young girl, I took her by the hand and with my right hand, and I called her back to life. And in many other things which are recorded in the gospel and which are known to all, I wanted to be there with my presence. This teaches the way in which the priest must behave in his operating. Since the future life of the church was enclosed in mine, and these are things that pertain to you, though in general, but your specific circumstance they will find on Calvary. I, priest and victim, lifted up on the wood of the cross, wanted a priest to be present, to assist me in that state of victim. Who was that priest? And he was St. John, who represented the nascent church. Nascent meaning newly born. 
In him, in St. John, I saw everyone, all the popes, the bishops, the priests, and all the faithful together. And while assisting me, he offered me as victim for the glory of the Father and for the good outgrowth of the nascent church. The fact that a priest assisted me in that state of victim did not happen by chance, but everything was a profound mystery predisposed from all eternity in the divine mind, intending that when I choose a soul as victim for the grave needs present in the church, a priest must offer her to me, assist her for me, and help her and encourage her to suffer. If these things are understood, fine, they themselves will receive the fruit of the work they offer just like St. John. How many goods did he not receive for having assisted me on Mount Calvary? If then they are not understood, they do nothing but put my work amid continuous contrasts, diverting my most beautiful designs. I'll finish what Jesus said here and then we will move on to our next talk. In addition to this, my wisdom is infinite and when it sends some cross to a soul for her sanctification, it does not take that soul alone, but five, ten, as many as I please, so that not one alone, but all others together may be sanctified. In fact, on Calvary I was not alone. In addition to having a priest, I had a mother. I had friends and also enemies. And on seeing the prodigy of my patience, many of them believed in me as the God I was and were converted. Had I been alone, would they have received these great goods? Certainly not. He's arguing this point with Louisa because she always prayed that he would keep the priests away from her and even her visitors she didn't want. You know, it's how can't you take them away from me? Can't it just be between you and me? That was one of her desires. And, of course, she was trained eventually not to ask these questions. So he's trying to explain to her, there comes a time in Jesus' relationship with the soul that loves him deeply and is in communion with him in the divine will manner that she is kept solitary and hidden. But Jesus is explaining to Louisa, even in his own life, had he remained hidden and obscure in Nazareth, no one would have known about the reality of his life as the Messiah and Saviour of the world. So he's saying to Louisa, you must live the same way. Now it's your turn to be known and to have people investigate you, find out more about you, which she hated. She didn't like that at all. So there's always the time. The time of hiddenness is usually longer and the time of public revelation is usually shorter. Why is that? Because as soon as you go public with the truth, that's when they want to kill you. See? So this is the lesson of many souls and you investigate the, the look at Joan of Arc. I think I've forgotten her age when she was... Uh, yeah, I was thinking that. I thought I'd heard that before. She was 33 when she was burnt at the stake. Um, once you become, go public with the truth, um, you are martyred for the truth because the truth is a sign of contradiction 
to other human beings a contradiction against their life, the way they are living. So they must suffocate your voice or kill you. So one way or the other, you will be attacked once you go public. In your hiddenness, you can have a relationship with Jesus, not that there aren't sufferings in that, because they certainly are, but they're not the same kind of sufferings. So this is the lesson Jesus is teaching Louisa, but speaking to her, he's speaking to you. So if you make a consecration of yourself with a priest to become a victim soul in the divine will, he's commanding that priest to pay special attention over you because you become another Jesus suffering, crucified, spoken against, martyred in so many different ways. And many, many of you may not know, but Louisa was forced to sign, not forced, but um, they declared her to be a false mystic, the hierarchy. And she ended up signing a document. It puzzled me why she did it, because I thought, but that's not true. Why would she sign something not true? And a, a priest, I think it was, in her life told her that she must accept condemnation the way Jesus accepted it. So she had to do that act as well. He was condemned as someone possessed by the devil, um, if you read your gospel properly. And... That's what look, every victim soul must go through that condemnation because a true victim soul has to live through all the acts of Jesus' life on earth in one form or another. So if you have read the lives of the saints, you'll notice that many of them went through periods of condemnation and even excommunication. Mother Mary MacKillop was excommunicated by her bishop. So it's the church that, I think it was Padre Pio said, um, God help those who um, create... Cre made, but God help those that make them. Thank you, Suzanne. <laughs> Saints are made, but God help those who make them. So there's the ones, when the hierarchy decides to crucify a saint or martyr a saint, as happened to St. Joan of Arc. Um, who said that? I think it was Padre Pio. He said, God help those who make, who make the saints because they'll be judged very severely because they just like the Sanhedrin that wanted to crucify Jesus. So... That crime, of course, is able to be forgiven, you know, uh, because all sins are able to be forgiven if someone is sorry, very sorry. So that's the end of my last talk because I wanted to mention mention it because of the, the beauty of Saint Hanibala, whom I love very deeply. Because without St. Anibolo's fervour and gifting of his life to publicate, publish the Book of Heaven, which he did avidly and got all the um, sisters and the priests of his order to assist him in that, and he gave up everything else he was doing for this one mission he had. So he's the patron saint of any priest or lay person that is engaged in propagating the Book of Heaven. And his heart is incorrupt, which is a great sign and miracle from God, how much God loves him, Saint Anibale. Otherwise, some people called him the English version of Saint Hannibal, but in in Italian, it's Saint Annibale de Francia. And we ask his prayers 
and assistance for all the priests of the divine will who are propagating the celestial doctrine. Now we're going to move on to talk six, which is about how to live in the fourth degree, or how to live, it's really how to live in the divine will, that's what that's what it actually means, believe it or not. Some people form some mystical sort of aura around the fourth degree to the extent that it, it might sound like it's a it's mission impossible. Well, you know, it's not complex, really. All the previous talks are basically what it means to live in, in possession. I do, actually don't like calling it the fourth degree because if you read volume 19 and the four degrees that Jesus describes the first three degrees as I said I don't think I'm going to call it the fourth degree anymore but Jesus does say in volume 19 which I I'm not going to quote you can check it out for yourself um he describes three degrees of living in the d divine will prior to entering the fourth degree. And then he says to Louisa, what I want from you is to live in the fourth degree, which is basically possession of the divine will. So you can check that out for yourself. So the fourth degree is full possession of the divine will in a continual um, infusion of Jesus' divine humanity and his acts into the soul. We've covered that quite in de quite detail over the last three days. Jesus said to bring a soul to live in full possession of the divine will Jesus calls it the prodigy of prodigies. So if any of you here are living in full possession of the divine will, you are a prodigy of prodigies. Because the human will is so persistent in wanting to remain alive and active. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad you said yes because it just has a propensity to it that even in holy things it wants to uh, have its own way. But Jesus never asked something difficult, he said to Louise. I don't ask difficult things. And if it is a prodigy, it's because he does it. You know, you you do very little. I always like saying the contract between the soul and God in the divine will is you give him nothing and he gives you God. He gives you himself. Totally, totally himself. There's, he holds nothing back. So... That's just astonishing and he doesn't require anything of you. He only requires, he told in the Gospel of Redemption, he said to Mary, uh, to Martha, 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 now this is the saint he's talking to, you worry and you fret about so many things, but very few are needed. There is only one thing necessary. Mary has chosen it, and it shall not be taken away from her. So for years in my little hermitage, I pondered that phrase for such a long time before I came into the divine will, what is this one thing necessary? 
So what's Mary doing? She's sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him. So I thought, well, that's adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. That's what I thought at the time. So I, wherever I could, I'd go to adoration. And I lived quite a distance from where adoration was happening. And I thought that was it, the one thing necessary. It's a bit like St. Francis, you know, when God said, go and be rebuild my church, you know, and he goes down to re rebuild the, um, the church uh, and starts gathering rocks <laughs> <laughs> until, until God makes it clearer to him, you know, what he meant. So sometimes God will speak to you something like a, an inner locution or something, but you don't fully understand what it means until years later. So I thought this one thing necessary was adoration. And I, I, I eventually got an all-night adoration established in my parish, which took some doing. Um, because that's what I thought. Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet listening to him. But when I came into the divine will, I understood it differently in the different dimension. What are you doing when you're reading the book of heaven? You're listening to the word of God speak to you. So when we go to adoration, I know I use the books of St. Peter, Julian, A. Mard a lot and uh, St. Alphonsus Liguri. But these were prayers that they created. But when you read the book of heaven, Mary Magdalene was sitting at Jesus' feet. The word of God was speaking to her and she refused to be distracted. When I started reading the Book of Heaven a long time ago, that was my main activity all day, apart from my chores and that. I understood this was the one thing necessary because he says it in the Book of Heaven. He wants the Book of Heaven propagated as the new gospel for the new era. The sanctifying fiat, he wants it to become embedded in the church and it's going to take a long time before the hierarchy embrace this, but he's already begun the triumph and the establishment of the kingdom in each one of you. Each one of you is a kingdom of the divine will. When you watch little children play, they're not concerned with the dramas of the world. They're present. They're present to each other. They're in the present moment. And Jesus said, unless you become little, like that little child, you will not enter the kingdom. He said, you will not enter the kingdom. So we have to become a joyful people, little children playing together with each other and with God himself. And we've got to show that joy. That was something I think Jesus loved St. Philip Neri for because he was regarded as one of the most joyful saints. He was always joyful. He used to love put, um, practical jokes. He used to love pulling practical jokes on people. But he was a very serious saint and he suffered a lot. But his joy just emanated. <coughs> so, let's get on with the, <coughs> the next stage. So thank you for your beautiful wows and it's really lovely, it's beautiful, I love it. We love you though. Oh, do you darling? Yeah, we, we do. Everyone say I love you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Oh, 
might be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very true. Oh, very thank, true. thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Um, the book that you were given as a free gift, you're given three books, The Hours of the Passion, The Compendium, which is a very important book to accompany the hours because it's quotes from the Book of Heaven concerning each hour. And it just helps you to expand your knowledge and understanding. And the book called The Way, is there one there, Louise? The Way That I Can Hold Up? It's on the screen. Oh, thank you. Oh, oh, it's on the screen. The Way of Living in the Divine Will. Yeah, we read out of those. Oh, did you? Oh, okay. So... In the way, what I did was condense volume 11 into 111 ways of living, which, which is a checklist for you to see, am I truly living fully in the divine will? And when you, you don't have to read it all at once, just read, maybe read a page every day or so often and have a checklist to see are you living in the divine will the way Jesus wants you to live in it. Also Michael later on will put up the website where all my books are on that website. There's about 44 of them and you they're on different subjects and aspects of living in the divine will. So you, you can just go open that page and scroll down and just pick one that looks... Uh, I mean, I've got most of the books in a Joseph's place, but you can get them printed yourself, even just in black and white, you know, cheaply, as long as you read what's in them. Can I just say to anyone who didn't get one, could you just see me and I'll, I'll give you one? Mm. We've got one. Okay. It's a very important book because uh, the 36 volumes, what's in the 36 volumes is contained in a sort of synopsis form in volume 11. And so uh, people that don't get as much time to read as I do can use that book as, you know, just check what's happening. Now we're going to focus on an interesting aspect of what's called living in the divine will. Do you remember I told you on one of the talks, when someone approaches you and asks you, like, what's the retreat about? What were you doing? And you say, you I'm laughing till I'm crying. You, you, you usually say we're learning how to live in the divine will, right? I actually said that to two, two groups of people that were in the room here. What's this retreat about? I said the divine will was sort of, I was not acting according to my instructions to you. Well, because everybody who's not studying this celestial doctrine but they would say, but I'm living in the divine will too. Mm -hmm. And so what's he or she on about? It sounds a bit bizarre to me, you know, because living in the divine will is the commandment, even back um, time of Moses, it's like uh, you obey the commandments, that's God's will. So I encourage you not to say that to people because it puts them off in a way that they are misinterpreting what we're doing. So we're going to look 
at all the different creatures and in all the different hierarchies of living in the divine world now with images we'll put up on the screen. So even the devil lives in the divine will. How does the devil live in the divine will? Who said that? Thank you, darling. I can't see you. The devil lives in the justice of the divine will. You see him chained? How did he get unchained? Who let him out of this prison? Well, Adam did, yeah, Adam and Eve did originally in Genesis. Um, and in the book of heaven, Louisa asks, how did the devil get into paradise? If Adam and Eve were living in the divine will, which Jesus tells us the devil cannot get in there. So Louisa asks him, how did the devil get in Jesus? Because, you know, her understanding was the, the devil cannot penetrate the divine will. He's got two powerful lessons, but one of the lessons is he stopped loving me. Now, what do you do when you stop loving Jesus? Maria? You don't do your rounds. That's it. He got lazy with his rounds. Because Adam was only given one commandment. If Adam and Eve were living in the divine will, which Jesus tells us the devil cannot get in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Louisa asks him, how did the devil get in Jesus? Because, you know, her understanding was the, mm -hmm. the devil cannot penetrate the divine will. He's got two powerful lessons, but one of the lessons is he stopped loving me. Now, what do you do when you stop loving Jesus? Maria? You don't do your own. That's it. He got lazy with his rounds. Because Adam was only given one commandment. What was it? Come on, spin the tree. No, yeah, yes, but what was the the primary commandment was go through all creation and name every creature Sealing every creature with your I love you, returning to God the glory due to God, because creation was created for Adam. Mm -hmm. And for you, well, that's another story, but mm -hmm. let's look at just that, sec that part. All of creation was basically, you know, when a little baby, a new child is expected, what do the parents do? They... They make a beautiful nursery and they de decorate it. Well, the nursery for Adam was creation. Every creature in creation was an I love you from his father and eternal mother to him. And all he had to do was his rounds of gratitude in creation. And then not eat of the fruit of that tree in the middle of the garden. So he had one, one law. Do not eat the fruit of that tree because if you do, you will die. So Satan got in because Satan can't get in where the divine will reigns in your heart, mind and soul. <laughs> you have to allow him entry. Mm. 
He is chained up forever by the victory of Christ over Satan. Satan was chained forever and he would have stayed there if the human will had have received the gift of redemption. But the majority didn't. And that's how Satan got back into the world through the ingratitude of human beings to the gift being offered. Jesus says in the book of heaven, my greatest wound is the wound of ingratitude on behalf of my children because he's given everything to us, including his own life, death and suffering. He gave us the most beautiful heavenly mother that could ever exist. He gave us a beautiful spiritual father in St. Joseph. And he gave us Louisa as the depository of the third fiat. He, he's given us everything. And that's why he says many times in the book of heaven, my greatest wound, although he, you know, there are other, uh, other aspects of his woundedness is the loss of souls, but the greatest wound he receives from human beings on earth is ingratitude. But despite their ingratitude, he does not withdraw his love from us. Not even a skerrick. The sun comes up every morning. It rises for you. It shines on you and tells you, I love you, I love you. Every flower still blooming after all these years, all the beautiful flowers, the animals and the plants and the insects telling you, I love you, I love you. So all created things live in the divine will and function in him, in the nature in which he created them. Because having no will of their own, they are always living continuously within the nature and function appropriated to them by the divine will. So nothing changes in nature. Only in human beings, of course, because of their free will, does human beings have the capacity to invite Satan, unchain him and bring him back into the world or by permission of God himself, which is in the book of Job where God gives Satan permission to test Job. It's in the book of heaven where God gives the demons permission to test and trial and tempt Louisa. Did, can anyone tell me how long that was? Was it three months or three years? Who? Three years, Roger. So, but this is by special permission of God, right? wasn't because Louisa had done anything to invite Satan into her life. So there's only two ways Satan gets back into the arena of human beings. That's by the human will inviting Satan back through sinful behaviour or directly through occult practices or by the permission of God himself. So then his chains are broken and he's allowed a period of time, which you know he was allowed a hundred years. Can someone clarify that for me about when that hundred years was given? This is in recent, this is in recent history. Anyway, we won't go. We are the vision. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Uh, yeah, now I remember that. I just couldn't remember it from that. 
So there was a hundred years where God permitted humanity to be affected by the demonic. So remember me telling you every act you do is an exorcism? Mm -hmm. Why is it an exorcism? Come on, speak out loud. I can't Jesus, hear you. Jesus in us. Yeah, because Jesus lives in us in the act. The devil cannot reside in any act that's fused into Jesus. It's an exorcism of human activity. Every act is an exorcism. This is how your priesthood is in the divine will is activated by the fusion of your acts. It's part of your priesthood in the divine will to exorcise Satan from human nature and human acts. And I just to I have at the name of Jesus yes. every knee shall bow. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in bend and every head shall bow yeah. Yeah. on earth, in heaven and under the earth and, under, under and in the, the underworld yeah. yes, <laughs> yeah. that's correct Yeah, at the name of Jesus so when you say that holy name of Jesus or Jesus I say in uh, praying my rosary to Jesus Mary, Joseph and Louisa a, a, a prayer at the end which Carol Vaughan added after her every mystery because those four names at the mere mention of their names the demons are completely paralyzed but when you pray those names in the divine will because that means Jesus and the divine will is praying them in you that is an exorcism too. So when you're putting your rosaries in the divine will, pause when you pray the name of Jesus, bow your head reverently, and that will exorcise the demonic. Because they cannot, uh, in, in an actual audio I heard of an exorcism, when the demons were being exorcised, the priest asks the demon to, to pronounce the name of Mary and they can't, they cannot say the name of Mary. They call her that woman and they say it in very hateful tones and they nearly choke, they choke. So when you say the name of Mary, and this is also used by exorcists, official exorcists, uh, that's one of the most powerful exorcisms in when they're doing an official exorcism. The holy names of Jesus, Mary, Joseph and Louisa, Joseph's called the terror of demons in his litany, are so powerful that even if you find yourself incapable of doing your rounds or praying in a conscious way, just go around doing your duties saying, the names of Jesus, Mary, Joseph and Louisa, I love you. That's easy enough to do, you know, and it's a powerful exorcism. So we can see how the devil lives under the justice of the divine will and he can only get back into the arena of humanity through invitation of human beings or through sinful acts of human beings or through occult rituals which literally invite him into the lives of human beings. If that didn't happen, Satan could not, could not operate. But to the soul who lives in the divine will, in the fullness of possession, Jesus said, Satan can't get any near to you because he doesn't even want to come close to you because he would suffer more getting close to you than he suffers in hell. 
more suffering from the light of the divine will than he suffers in hell. But what he does is he stirs up all your family and your friends and tries to cause a commotion around you to disturb you and to throw you off what your purpose is. That's what he does. So next is <clears throat> the angels. No, what's the next one? Yeah. These are the individual souls in humanity. You can't see them probably from back there, but it's a collage of the faces of people. And all of humanity, all human beings, live in the divine will in different degrees. Sinners live in the mercy of the divine will. Saints live in the unity with the divine will. And we live in the generative virtue of the divine will. So when you talk to people and they say, what was your retreat about? <laughs> you can say, we're learning how to live in the generative virtue of our Father. And if you don't want to talk to them, you just say one word, it was well. <laughs> true, true. And as the soul who lives in his generative virtue gives birth to himself for as many acts as she does in him, with him and through him, this is called the fourth degree or full possession of the divine will. So now there's other aspects. This, this is all humanity, right? Because scripture says... In him we live, we move, and have our being. So even the sinner cannot walk or talk or think or do anything they're doing, even sin, without the permission of the divine will. Because it's the divine will in every humanity that causes you to breathe, to walk, to talk, to do all your activities and motions. And that's the mercy of God. He will not strike the sinner dead. He allows the sinner to keep living in him so that he has every opportunity to convert and to live fully possessed of him, which is his ultimate aim. So sinners live in the mercy of the divine will. Saints live in the unity of the divine will. But we live in the generative power. There's saints, there's some of the saints that lived in the unity of the divine will. And then we live in the generative power of the divine will. Now the next image is, Michael, the, this is the generative virtue of the divine will which was first lived fully in our Blessed Mother. She is the first created human being to be able to conceive and give birth to God himself. So that's a beautiful image of our Heavenly Mother living in the generative virtue of the divine will because in Jesus she matched him in every breath he breathed. She fused her breath and breathing into him. In every sorrow he felt, she fused her sorrow into him. In every step he walked, she fused her steps and walking into him. She was doing what souls later would be invited to do through Louisa, 
by this constant fusion of I love you, I thank you, I praise you, I bless you, I adore you. This is true adoration here, witnessing it with our Blessed Mother. And he's receiving all that love from her and she's receiving all that love from him. Now being one with her, because Jesus says in the Book of Heaven, it was not Our Lady's perpetual virginity that drew him from heaven. It was not her immaculate conception, despite what some people teach, because God, that was the act of God in her. It was the power of her fiat which he gave at her conception because he said, I cannot incarnate myself in a soul that has not given me totally with a pure heart her own will. So because Our Lady did that at the moment of her conception, and never withdrew her will back into herself, he was able to incarnate himself in her. So be, becoming one with her and she with him, he, God the Father in his will, impregnates in her his own life and generates all of his children in her through nuptial fiat of love with her. So when Jesus was conceived and born through her, you were conceived and born through her. Because he left the mansions of his heavenly Father where he's completely happy and he came and entered the degraded state of humanity because as soon as he was conceived, we read that today, the cross was conceived in him. And he left the mansions of his father in order to capture you, his bride. That's what he did for you. That's made me see the beauty of the cross. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He abandoned heaven, he, even his father's love. He had to live through the deprivation of not feeling that connection. It's, I mean, it was always there, but he just deprived himself of the happiness of feeling the father's love within him. Take five. Just take five and stretch. Okay. Thank you. Stretch your legs. In the sacramentals. So often in places where the sacraments weren't available, uh, good Christians or good Catholics would honour the sacramentals they had, like wearing the uh, brown scapula, the miraculous medal, which which I also do. I wear two scapulas of St. Joseph and Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And um, most of my friends wear the miraculous medal, like over there on Bernie, the beautiful big one. Sacramentals do not have the same power as the sacraments themselves. But the highest sacramental in the church is, is the blessing of the priest. Did you know that? Yeah. So the highest sacramental in the church is the blessing of a priest. Most priests do not know that. <laughs> Even Orthodox priests that I've spoken to, they do not know that. Uh, I gave a priest retreat last year and I was surprised that the priests present did not know that except one. 
uh, because it's the highest sacramental of the church, Jesus shows that with Louisa in her petrification, it required the blessing of a priest to give her life again. The blessing of a priest resurrected her body from petrification. So whenever you're with a priest, humbly ask him, Father, would you bless me before I uh, go and, you know, whatever. If you've been to Mass, do not ask him that. You've also already received in the Mass many times his blessing. Mm -hmm. And also in the Mass you've received the blessing of Christ himself. So don't bother the priest after Mass. It's really not the right thing to do anyway. You should... You shouldn't bother a priest before Mass either or after Mass. Many people do because he's preparing for his greatest office before Mass, at least he should be. And after Mass, after he celebrated the great sacrament of the Eucharist, he should, and most holy priests do, like to be left alone to give their thanksgiving but if you're with a priest at some other celebration and you're about to leave and you go up to father and say father would you give me your blessing please do you see the difference in what i'm saying um the priests probably most of the time don't understand the power of their blessing because of their ordination into the priesthood, it's Christ blessing you in a unique way. So this is the generative, it's an image of our Blessed Mother, who was the first and only creature before Louisa to be able to generate God through the power of her fiat. So I'm not going to go into any more great depth on that um, because I've spoken to that before. So the next stage is the triumphant stage of living in the divine will. The angels were the first to live in this triumphant stage. Before Adam was tempted, who was tempted? The devil. Who was tempted? Eve. No, before. In heaven. Oh, yeah. The angels were tempted, all of them. All of them, including Lucifer, but what tempted him? Thank you, God. Thank you. Yes, it was actually the same temptation he gave to Adam and Eve. But did God say that? Did God say you will die? No, no, you won't die. You will be like God. Mm -hmm. You will know good and evil. Now in heaven, Lucifer was in the highest choir. He had the greatest office, far greater than St. Michael, who belonged to the lowest choir. The choir of the archangels is the lowest choir. So why did God choose an angel from the lowest choir to defeat Lucifer, which means light, angel of light. In other words, he had a superior intelligence. Why did God choose Michael to defeat him? He wanted Satan to be defeated by someone 
who is in the lowest order of the angels, to show Lucifer the depth of his pride and to humiliate him, like Goliath was defeated by the little shepherd David with one stone. And this is how prideful men and women are defeated. God uses something little and powerless to overcome the powerful of this world. And he said in the book of heaven, he chose Louisa because she was the littlest and the least powerful of all humanity in the world. And she's the one chosen to bring in the era of the triumph over Lucifer. So the angels there, beautiful image, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, representing the seven archangels, um, but of course also the nine choirs of angels are the different choirs. Uh, does anyone know the names of the nine choirs? Seraphim. What is seraphim noted for? Love. Cherubim. What are cherubim noted for? Knowledge. Knowledge of God. Knowledge. Thrones are noted for their humility. Dominions, for the, their dominion over the senses and that. So if you want to control, if you've got a problem with any of your senses and your, um, of your humanity, invite the choir of dominions. There's other aspects to their dominion. Uh, the Virtues, of course, are for the virtues of God. They reflect and reverberate the virtues of God and the divine attributes of God. The uh, powers are the, the angels that have power, God's power, to defeat Satan. And the archangels and guardian angels, principalities, sorry, are the angels that guard the principalities of the church, which are the arch, various archdioceses. Because you know each archbishop is called a prince of the church. The principalities are the archdioceses over which the Archbishop presides as a father and prince of the church. So if you call upon the choir of principalities, when I do my rounds in the angels, I've done a book on the rounds of the angels. I go through each of these choirs and do my rounds, my I love you and gratitude, and I send with the divine will, I command these angels to go to their various, do their various office. Now, every human being has a guardian angel, but human beings that live in the divine will have how many angels attending them? Ten. 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 Thousands upon thousands. Well, Je well Je Jesus said to Sam in the book, uh, volume 11, that thousands upon thousands of angels, that's his words, not mine, thousands upon thousands really means if you multiply a thousand by a thousand times, it's like virtually saying uncountable numbers. Um, okay. What? Pretty crowded, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, very crowded. It's a lot of angels in here. And he says, um, I read it out to you in my first talk, 
these thousands upon thousands of angels accompany each soul that lives in the divine will and when they are praying the hours of the passion they come to take from your lips the words you are praying they're on your lips wish I could find that quote they're on your lips to take from you because it's Jesus speaking they take from you the words of the hours of the passion to heaven to present these hours to the eternal father is coming from your lips that's why you recite them out loud wherever you can as long as you don't do it in public while you're waiting in the queue for Woolies checkout because <laughs> we don't want you to be sent into the funny farm yet <laughs> and um, you find a nice quiet place to do the hours and recite them. Jesus uses the word recite them out because the eternal word speaking the new creation into being. The eternal word speaks. He does not sit and meditate. He speaks. And you are a voice and an organ, his words, not mine. You are an organ for the eternal word to speak the new creation into being, into existence. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when you do your rounds out loud or do the hours of the passion out loud, not only are you saving a soul for every word you recite, but you are speaking these divine lives into existence. And these divine lives are populating the kingdom of heaven. You can't see them now, but you will see them one day. And you will be seen by them as if you are their mother or father. Yes, Daniel? So in that case, no, you can do them anywhere. I do them in front of the Blessed Sacrament, but of course I have to be silent when I'm with other souls in adoration. But when I'm alone at home, I do them out loud. Yes, because Jesus knows uh, there are circumstances which prevent you from saying them out loud. But if you have a desire to say them out loud, it's all in your desire. I want to say them out loud, Jesus, but you know I can't hear them now. But I wish and desire it. And that desire in itself is sufficient to be accepted by our Lord. It's not a commandment. It's more like Jesus' desire to hear his own words emanate through all creation. Because when I say I'm, I'm out, I've got a little table on my, my front veranda, and if I go out there early in the morning with my hours and I recite them out loud, you know, the birds are hearing me. You know, the local bush turkey's listening to me. The, the um, what do you call that big lizard? The, the, the uh, what? Goanna. Oh yeah, the goannas are listening to me. In fact, I was sitting out there one day and I heard all this scratching and I looked down it was this big, you know, about five foot goanna was sitting at my feet, you know, scratching the, the veranda. And um, they can hear you because the divine will is in them to hear you. But because they're hearing the eternal words speaking, they're attracted to the origin of their being. So this is why certain things happen to you. 
that are beautiful, like a butterfly landing on your shoulder or something like that. It's um, you're not you're not speaking out to uh, no audience. You have an audience wherever you are, because all creatures if having the divine will in them are listening to the divine word speaking. St. Francis used to do this quite a bit, speak to the animals, you know, and the, and the fish. St. Anthony, when people wouldn't listen to him, he went and gave his sermon to the fish and they all came up and listened to him. You've heard that story, haven't you? Yes. So um, these are not made up stories, but in the divine will we, we understand now why that's happening. We understand. Oh, where am I up to, Michael? So In this the is triumph. the triumphant. These are beings, created beings, that live in the triumphant state of the divine will. And of course, the greatest one is our Blessed Mother. She is the greatest created being that triumphs over the human will in extraordinary dimensions. She became divinized by living her life not for one single moment in her own will. So this is a beautiful picture of the Assumption of Our Lady which as you know is the feast of the divine will which we celebrate every year. So you, can you see the different dimensions of living in the divine will? Now I'm going to tell you again the ultimate dimension. That is the ultimate, but it's described in the higher volumes that the souls, the children of Our Lady who become little queens and kings, in the royal family of the divine will in heaven live inside the sun of the divine will in heaven. All the other blessed, no matter how wonderful they were, how heroic, how many miracles they perform, live outside the sun, receive all the radiation of light and their blessedness from the souls that live inside the sun of the divine will in heaven. Is that S-U-N or S-O-N? S-U-N. Yes. Yeah, this sun is the sun of the divine will. Um, Jesus has so many teachings about the analogy for the divine will, comparing it to this, the sun in our galaxy, um, that using that as an analogy, but the sun of the divine will, of course, is far greater. So that's the ultimate, the ultimate state of living in the triumphant phase of the divine will. But do you know what Jesus loves most? He loves the souls that live in the generative state because he said in the triumphant state in heaven, they, because they cannot suffer, they're not able to generate divine lives through their acts of suffering, love on earth. So he said, the souls in heaven envy you. We might envy them, but they envy you because you still hopefully have many, many more decades to live and you still have the capacity to live in the generative state of the divine will, giving birth to divine lives. So you are envied by the blessed in heaven.
No matter what state of suffering you're in, it doesn't matter how little or how small, why you or how big, I should say. While you are fusing your sufferings, your sorrows, your tears, your heart aches, your mental states, your breakdowns, your near-death experiences, all of that, when you're fusing that into Jesus, suffering humanity, you are giving birth to innumerable divine lives. This is the joy of all of heaven. And even the creatures out there that don't have a will receive a reverberation of that joy coming from you. So when Jesus, Mary and Joseph were walking to all those hundreds of miles or whatever it was to Egypt with the little donkey, all of creation would gather around them, you know, because they're attracted to the origin of their own life. And here was the three human beings on earth that formed the new paradise of the kingdom on earth. So you can be so happy, very, very happy that you've come into this fiat. It's the fiat of our Blessed Mother. She is the origin of this fiat. Or I should say Jesus is, of course, but she was the first creature to enter this fiat and she lived it to the superlative degree every moment of her life. So, Louisa said, I was thinking to myself, what is the difference between one who lives in the divine will and one who is resigned to the painful circumstances of life and one who doesn't do the divine will at all? So she's describing three different states of, of human existence. And my sweet Jesus coming back at it, my blessed daughter, the difference is so big that there is no comparison at all. One who lives in my will has dominion over all and we love her so much that we even let her dominate ourselves. We are so pleased in seeing the little creature dominating us that we feel unusual joy because we see that our will dominates in the creature and she dominates together with our will. Oh, how many times we let her win. Many times our joy is so great that we let our will win in the creature instead of in ourselves. What happened at the wedding feast of Cana? Jesus said, my time has not yet come. And Our Lady didn't even respond. She just said to the servants, do whatever he tells you because she knew he would surrender to her. That's what's happening here. Many times our joy is so great that we let our will win in the creature instead of in ourselves. Further, by living in the divine will, being in continuous contact with it, notice the word continuous. When I go home on my browser, I'm going to find out how many times that word is in the 36 volumes because Jesus says continuous so many times. In continuous contact with it, she acquires divine senses. Remember me saying to you, you will lose your human senses. You will acquire the divine senses. She acquires a long sight. That's called omniclairvoyance where you can see the way God sees the history of humanity. 
Her light is so penetrating and clear that she can even fix herself in God in whom she sees the divine mysteries. She can touch our sanctity and beauty, loving them and possessing them. With this eye of light, she can find her creator everywhere. There's nothing in which she can't find him. That's even in the person who's humiliating you, abusing you. With omniclairvoyance, you can see that Jesus, the divine will, is operating in that creature in order to give you the gift of criticism, of humiliation, in order for you to transfuse that back into the divine will and create a divine act from it, which Jesus did in his passion. She acquires a long sight, only clairvoyance. Her light is so penetrating and clear that she can even fix herself in God in whom she sees the divine mysteries. There's nothing in which she can't find him. With his majesty and his love, he bundles the creature and makes her feel how much he loves her. In feeling her love, he loves her. And oh, how unspeakable are the joys on both parts, feeling his love and loving him in everything. She acquires divine hearing, and soon she hears what we want. So all other voices will disappear for you. You know the voices you used to hear in your head? I'm good at nothing. <laughs> you know all those voices? Or the voices that people you grew up with used to call you, all the names they called you or whatever like that. All of that disappears because you only listen to the Word of God speaking. And soon she hears what we want. She is always intent on listening to us. Notice, that's the one thing necessary. She's always intent on listening to us. And there is no need to repeat again and again what we want. Once the divine will speaks, it's deposited in you forever. Don't worry if you can't remember it. It's deposited in you forever. Because when the divine will speaks, his speech manifests what he says and it's deposited in you forever. Even if you have a faulty memory or an intellect that can't call to mind what he said, he does not take back out of you what he's deposited in you. Uh, a small sign is enough and all is done. She acquires a divine sense of smell. By merely smelling, she feels whether that which is around her is good, holy, and belongs to us, or the opposite. I know you've experienced this. She acquires divine taste to the extent that she fills herself with love and all that is of heaven. I've got a book over there called Human Taste and Divine Taste. When you lose all your human taste, you will acquire the divine taste. Louisa did not eat or taste or digest food even when she was given obedience to eat. It all came back perfectly pure, undigested and uncontaminated. All her human taste died completely 
She did not sleep. She went into a state of petrification so she could travel with Jesus through the universe, wherever he took her. And then when she came back into her body, this is when she's reached the state of full possession because earlier on she did sleep. But little by little he took away all her human taste and all her, everything human in her. Finally, in our will, she acquires our touch so that all is pure and holy and there is no fear that even the smallest breath may shade her. All beautiful, lovely and pretty is the one who lives in my fiat. On the other hand, one who is only resigned does not live in continuous contact with us it can be said that she does not know anything about our supreme being. That's pretty strong words. It can be said that she does not know anything about our supreme being. Her sight is so weak and sickly that it is painful for her even to look. She suffers from the last stage of myopia and she can hardly see even the most necessary things. She can hardly hear and how very much it takes to make her listen, if she listens at all. Her smell, taste and touch sense what is human. She feeds herself with earthly things. She feels the touch of passions and the sweetness of mundane pleasures. She doesn't even do my will every day, but only in painful circumstances and encounters when my will offers her a suffering. Oh, poor creatures, without my continuous will, how weak they grow, so nervous and ill as to move to pity. How I pity them. Finally, one who is not even resigned blind and with no sense of smell, loses the taste for every good. She is a poor paralytic who cannot really help herself. She imprisons herself in a web of unhappiness and sins and is not able to get out. Volume 36, April 12, 1938. And I read that because I wanted to show you the difference between a soul who lives just resigned and one who lives in full possession of the divine will. Because that's what it, 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 it is to live in the so-called fourth degree. There is a quote um, from volume 19, July the 2nd, 1926 which shows you the great difference there is between the sanctity of the virtues practiced in the fiat of redem redemption and the sanctity of sanctities, which is the sanctity of God himself. And if you read that full lesson, volume 19 July the 2nd 1926 when you get the retreat book you can um, revise these divine truths yourself slowly most that's how most of the retreatants use my retreat book after the retreats over they just take the book home and then they either in their prayer group or individually they just go through the book slowly and it reinforces what we've spoken about in the retreat. Isn't that the most beautiful picture of Jesus? And his face is just so good. I just yeah. So that I got that off um, Google Pics somehow. I don't know how I got it, but I liked that anyway. 
everyone has their own favourite picture of Jesus. Um, but now we're going to play a song that was very much loved in my former retreats and we love it so much because it's called So Will I, which is basically saying fiat. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath. The planets form, and if the stars were made to worship, so light, I can see your heart in it. Every burning star signal fire grace And if creation sings your praises so
chase down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created, the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion fairies disappear. We well, you lost your life so I could find it here. And if you left the grave behind you so to have your feedback it's sort of the last day so don't forget tonight when you go home and you can if you're nervous by getting on the mark mark you can oh hello can you hear me now well, tomorrow is the last day and it's feedback day from you. So if you're nervous speaking into the mic, just write down tonight something you'd like to say that stood out for you more clearly than anything else. Um, it's important to me to understand what Jesus and the Holy Spirit has given you to understand from these beautiful knowledges. So, Paul, you've got something to ask? Yeah, I just um, I just thought maybe you could give us the answer to this question. In our Divine Will Prayer Group, this question has come up a number of times, and it seems everyone's divided. Everyone pulls out their Book of Heaven and say, no, no, this is the answer here. This is the answer. And they seem to be conflicting. The question is, did St. Joseph live in the divine no. will? <laughs> that's, a, that's another retreat. <laughs> is, that another, is that a huge question? Is it? It's not just a yes. But you, with such great devotion to St. Joseph, I thought you're the perfect question, person to ask well, this question. It's not just that I have devotion to St. Joseph. Um, it started that way. I've read, I've written in obedience to a divine will priest the answer to your question in a large book called Joseph in the Eternal Fiat because my belief Is that over there? Can we buy that? No. It's not published yet because I'm reviewing it and improving it at the moment. So I was commanded to write it uh, by two of my spiritual directors and of a divine will priest some years ago. 
And uh, of course, I believe Joseph lived in the divine will. Yes. <laughs> because Joseph is the head of the preeminent house of the divine will on earth. The queen of the divine will married him, obeyed him, loved him. The king of heaven and earth, Jesus, the saviour of the world, obeyed him as his father. Now why would the divine will deprive his own father of the essence of himself and give it to you and me. Joseph's the only created man on earth that had the office of father to God. The doctors of the church say father of God, I say father to God and it is offensive to me having had a father who abandoned my mother when she was pregnant with her third child it's offensive to me to excommunicate the father of jesus because the great doctor saint uh, St. John Cardinal Newman is regarded as a brilliant theologian and convert to the Catholic faith has written a beautiful treatise on um, on the fatherhood of St. Joseph virgin father of God and explained how he was a true father of Jesus Biological fatherhood does not make you a good father or a true father, as my own father uh, was. I love my own father, but um, he abandoned my mother and us when I was four years of age. So fatherhood in itself has to be deposited in men in fact, the revelation to St. Mildred at uh, New Zeal, or she's not canonised yet, Sister Mildred at New Zeal, a victim soul where our ladies of America and St. Joseph appeared to her. And St. Joseph said to her, God wants to restore all fatherhood on earth through me, through St. Joseph, which has been my uh, illumination over my life of prayer meditating very deeply on the office of Joseph. Uh, there's many saints who agree with this and I've had to write a book um, uncommon to my way of writing because I had to write it in more of a sense of um, being able to argue the point to certain people in a way they will see it validated by, you know, more in the <laughs> academic way to see it validated by previous saints and doctors of the church. But you can't really do that because the previous saints and doctors of the church didn't live in the generative power of the divine will. So I've been given the uh, task of explaining it from the Book of Heaven. So, so it's like it's, it's, the saints call the Holy Family the Trinity on earth, mirroring the Trinity in heaven. How can you excommunicate Joseph from the living in the divine will with its generative power when he married the immaculate conception of all the divine lives of God. You can't marry the immaculate conception, that's Our Lady. She gave 
hold herself there. I am the Immaculate Conception. And her parish priest said, are you sure? He didn't say, I am an Immaculate Conception. No, St. Bernadette says, he, she said, I am the Immaculate Conception. What is the Immaculate Conception? You know? I will conceive without sin, but but more no, than more no, than that. No, no, no. What is the immaculate conception? The Holy Spirit, is it? Yes, yeah. it's the divine, the uncreated, the divine. It's the Trinitarian. The substance of the Trinity is the divine will. The origin of all immaculate conceptions of divine life. It's the divine will. Our Lady said, I am the immaculate conception. She's the mother of all the divine lives that have ever been created because Jesus is her son. Now, if you want to choose a husband for the Immaculate Conception and a father to God himself, are you going to leave him outside of the gift of the divine will? No. It's impossible for God not to give Joseph the fullness of the gift. But there are those in the divine will, fraternity, that keep on trying to do that and to my dying breath, I cannot do it. Well, uh, within our prayer group, it's, it's not that the people are anti-Joseph at all. They're just, they're just no, trying they're to learn. But they keep saying to us, oh, look, it says here that, that Louisa is the first person with original sin to live in the divine world. She's right? the first person. Uh, I've written about this in the book. Right. The fathers of the church from the Council of Constance which I've gone into, it's written in the book, The Life of Maurice of St. Joseph, actually um, wrote, these are the fathers of the church who attended the Council of Conscience, that the three members, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, lived in the order of the hypostatic union. So you study theology. The hypostatic union is the divine and human nature in Jesus, but it had an order. The order of the hypostatic union is the holy family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. They said this order, the sanctity and this order, even though they didn't know what living in the divine will meant as revealed later on to Louisa, they said the sanctity of this order of the hypostatic union, that's in Jesus, Mary and Joseph, was higher than any other orders in the, in the church and in creation, even higher than the angelic orders. But they also said nobody else can enter this order. It's an order within itself. They didn't know at that time that God had a plan to draw us as little newborns, Louisa being the first little newborn, into that order. Because that's the order of the divine and human nature perfectly existing as one in the humanity of Jesus. I love it. <laughs> Are you getting what I'm saying? Yeah. But the church didn't know at that time that the divine will intended to offer and make us new little newborns into that family. So if you read that book and if you read the theology of St. Lawrence of Brindisi, who's regarded as an apostolic doctor of the church, one of the greatest, the greatest doctors of the church by some people's measure. Um, he called it, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, the incarnational circle. Remember we read today about 
This is not unity, this is incarnation. The incarnational circle of Jesus, Mary, Joseph, St. Lawrence of Brindisi said, existed for all eternity in God as the model for every humanity that came after it, before creation began. Now, if the incarnational circle, which Jesus, Mary and Joseph lived in, in the divine world, it could not possibly have had one member living in their human will, no matter how holy that person is. It's not possible. And then I have whole chapters on, uh, in order to become one in the marriage, natural marriage, and also in marriage of a divine uh, dimension, which is what the virginal nuptial union of Mary and Joseph is, they became one body. What was the body they became one in? Divine will. Jesus' body. Jesus' divine humanity. His humanity merged in perfect union with the divine nature. That's the body they became one in. So this is a very deep, beautiful and most critical question. And that's why I have to write about it till my dying day and I will take all my lifetime writing about it because as far as I can tell, there's not one soul of all the teachers in the divine world in the world that is addressing this issue and it's critical because Jesus says in the book of heaven, Nazareth is the point of recall of the kingdom. Nazareth is the point of recall of the kingdom. I can't tell you the whole rest of it, Paul, because it's That's great. so big. <laughs> I'm stuck. That's fantastic. Thank you. The but best answer I've heard ever. <laughs> yeah. I've got a lot more wonderful things to tell you about that, I can tell you. But I can't do it. I, I would have to do a whole retreat on it, but I will maybe one day. And also the prophecy of Saint Isidore, a Josephian saint, said the victory bell will sound when the faithful recognise the sanctity of Saint Joseph. Saint Isidore of Isolanus prophesied in the 17th century that the victory bell will sound when the faithful recognise the sanctity of Saint Joseph. Yeah. So, well, it was good, it was wonderful, it was a little bell ringing there, but um, yes, it was wonderful, um, Sonia, because through Father Donald Calloway, whom I've, I've met and or I've spoken to and because of his great love for St. Joseph, who helped to engineer the uh, worldwide consecration of St. Joseph. His book is one of the best books you will ever read on St. Joseph. He spent three years of research on that book. Mm -hmm. Do Father Donald Calloway. Mm -hmm. And he speaks about it, of course, in all his interviews, but the book itself is brilliant, uh, but it's not like coming at it from the, that Divine Will Book of Heaven perspective. But you'll get a lot more knowledge about what the saints said about St. Joseph in that book than many other books. And he set it out in a fantastic format. So you didn't get too much like it was a devotional book, meditation book. He did an amazing job on that book. Very good question, Paul. 
really, really simple question, uh, Geraldine. When Louisa was petrified, did in the petrified state, did she breathe? Yeah, a petrified state is similar to a state when I did use the analogy of the hummingbird goes into a state called torpor and your metabolism goes down so low you know you might look like you're you're dead you're not dead but your metabolism goes down so low I mean if a doctor examined you they probably think you were about to die but you don't but with Louisa it was uh, gifted her by God so that her soul could leave her body and travel with Jesus so it was a miraculous state, you could say. When I say petrified, she looked like she was frozen and petrified. But as you know, in order for a body to live, it has to have a soul inside of it to live as a normal human being. But I'm not a doctor and therefore I can't describe it in, in medical terms, but it's not, it's not sleep you know, in the way we sleep. I call it petrification. And, um, yeah, it's just a, your metabolism goes very, very, very low. You'll have to ask someone with a little bit more knowledge about the body than me, because I don't understand how it operates. Any more questions? or comments. Did you learn anything today? Oh, yes. <laughs> so hat, <laughs> hats are having digestion problems. <laughs> I mean digesting the truths. You know. Sorry? I said you're having digestion problems, digesting all these wonderful <laughs> truths. Right. Yeah. I was just trying to think that, um, it might be a silly question, but just a thought that came to me. When you live in the divine will, can you be an organ donor? Can you be a what? A organ, a organ donor? donor. Oh, well, that's a, that's a, a question for a moral yeah. theologian, but I have my opinion about that. Um, well, Jesus himself was in his own way an organ donor. He gave Jesus, uh, Louisa his heart, and when uh, when we do our continual fusion of acts, he is transubstantiating in us his humanity. So, if your organ, I wouldn't personally donate my organs in the current medical climate. The reason I wouldn't is because of the scandal that has occurred by the places where your organ, in other words, you supposedly died and your organs are taken out and stored in a particular place in certain hospitals. And there were horrific scandals in America and Australia about the way these organs were treated by the medical staff. So I personally wouldn't do it because I'm entrusting the organs of my body to human wills that are not living a wholly sanctified life and I personally wouldn't do it. But that doesn't mean I would never do it if donating one of my organs might save a life. But Jesus gives him his entire humanity to us in Holy Communion so that we can live from his humanity. But we already have the uh, facility through the fusion of our acts into Jesus to allow him to give himself to all creatures. It's just whether they're disposed to receive him or not. So the question of organ donation is really outside the 
the, the uh, what are you, what were they? No, it's just outside of my um, brief. My res brief. That's it. It's outside of my brief. I only am here to answer questions about the Book of Heaven, not to answer those questions. Like, for example, what about cremation? Should I be allowed to cremate my body or should I be buried in all that? I have my opinion on these things, but I don't think it's up to me to tell other people what to do. Oh, would you? <laughs> You know, I said, Pat, I'm not ready to be crucified yet, so I've got to be careful about what I say because um, that man over there has puts me on YouTube. <laughs> you know, so it goes out to the whole world. I think that's funny. Do you? <laughs> I haven't, haven't got uh, that sort of technology. No, but if I say something controversial, yeah. you know, it could, uh, it could, oh, yeah, it, it could come back on the divine will. I don't yeah. care about myself, but it could come back on the divine will. So fortunately, Michael. It uh, deletes all the controversial parts. Summary. All the whales. No, look the whales in. The whales can stay. No, the whales will stay. When you say about the retreat, what it was like, wow. So will he. One single word. Somebody said, what does. W-A-W, man. What was it? Wonder of wonders.